Chapter 4 The Quiet House Miss Dovetail was buried in the graveyard in the city within the city where generations of royal servants lay. Daisy and her father stood hand in hand looking down at the grave for a long time. Bert kept looking back at Daisy as his tearful mother and grim-faced father led him slowly away. Bert wanted to say something to his best friend, but what had happened was too enormous and dreadful for words. Bert could hardly bear to imagine how he'd feel if his mother had disappeared forever into the cold, hard earth. When all their friends had gone, Mr. Dovetail moved the purple wreath sent by the king away from Miss Dovetail's headstone and put it in its place with the small bunch of snowdrops that Daisy had collected that morning. When the two dovetails walked slowly home to a house they knew would never be the same again. A week after the funeral, the king rode out of the palace with the royal guard to go hunting. As usual, everyone along his route came rushing out into their gardens to bow, curtsy, and cheer. As the king bowed and moved back, he noticed that the front garden of, guard, garden of one cottage remained empty. It had drapes at the windows and the front door. Who lives there? he asked Major Beamish. That's the Dovetail House, your majesty, said Beamish. Dovetail? Dovetail? said the king, frowning. I've heard that name, haven't I? Er, yes, sire, said M Major Beamish. Miss Do Mr. Dovetail is your majesty's carpenter, and Miss Dovetail is, was your majesty's head seamstress. Ah, yes, said King Fred hurriedly. I, I remember and spraying his milk-white charger into a canter. He rode swiftly past the black-draped windows of the dovetail cottage, trying to think of nothing but the day's hunting that lay ahead. But every time the king rode out after that, he couldn't help but fix his eyes on the empty garden and the black-draped door of the dovetail residence. And every time he saw the cottage, the imagine of the dead seamstress clutching that amethyst button came back to him. Finally, he could bear it no longer and summoned the chief advisor to him. Herringbone, he said, not looking the old man in the eye. There's a nice house on the corner on the way to the park. Rather a nice cottage, large-ish garden. The dovetail house, your majesty? Oh, that's who lives there, is it? King Fred said eerily. Well, it occurs to me that it's a rather big place for a small family. I think I've heard there are only two of them. Is that correct? Perfectly correct, Your Majesty. Just two, since the mother. It doesn't really seem fair, Herringbone, for that nice, spacious cottage to be only given to two people when there are families of five or six. I believe who'd be happy with a little more room. You'd like me to move the dovetails, Your Majesty? Yes, I think so, said King Fred, pretending to be interested in the tip of the satin shoe. Very well, Your Majesty, said the chief advisor. With a deep bow, I shall ask them to swap, swap with Roach's family, and I, who I'm sure will be, would be glad of more space, and I shall put the dovetails in the Roach's house. And where is that exactly? asked the king nervously, for the last thing he wanted was to see those black drakes even near the pal palace gates. Right on the edge of the city within the city, said the chief advisor. Very close to the graveyard in... F that sounds suitable, interrupted King Fred, leaping to his feet. I have no need of details. Just make it happen, Herringbone. There's a good chap. And so Daisy and her father were introduced, were instructed to swap houses with the family of Captain Roach, who, like Bert's father, was a member of the King's Royal Guard. The next time King Fred rode out, the black drapes had vanished from the door, and the Roach children, four strapping brothers, the ones who'd, cri who'd first christened Bert Beamish Butterball, came running into the front garden and jumped up and down, cheering and waving cornucopian flags. King Fred beamed and waved back at the boys. Weeks passed, and King Fred forgot all about the dovetails and was happy again. Chapter 5. Daisy Dovetail For some months after Miss Do Dovetail's shocking death, the king's servants were divided into two groups. The first group whispered that King Fred had been to blame for the way she died. The second preferred to believe that there had been some kind of mistake, and the king couldn't have known how ill Miss Dovetail was before the order, and that she must finish his suit. Miss Beamish, the pastry chef, belonged to the second group. The king had always been very nice to Miss Beamish, sometimes even inviting her t into the dining room to congratulate her on particularly fine batches of Duke's Delight or Folderol Fancies. So she, so she was sure he was a kind, generous, and considerate man. 
You mark my words. Somebody forgot to give the king a message. He told her husband, Major Beamish. He'd never make an ill servant work. I know he must feel simply awful about what happens. Yes, said Major Beamish. I'm sure he does. Like his wife, Major Beamish wanted to think the best of the king, because he, his father, and his grandfather before him had all served loyally in the royal guard. So even though Major Beamish observed the that King Fred seemed quite cheerful after Miss Dovetail's death, hunting as regularly as ever, and though Major Beamish knew that the Dovetails had been moved out of their old house to live down by the graveyard, he tried to believe that the King was sorry for what had happened to his seamstress, and that he'd had no hand in moving her husband and daughter. The Dovetail's new cottage was a gloomy place. Sunlight was blocked out by the high yew trees that bordered the graveyard. Although Daisy's bedroom gave her a clear view of her mother's grave, through a gap between dark branches. As she no, ling- live, no longer lived next to Bert, Daisy saw less of him in her free time. Although Bert went to visit Daisy as often as possible, there was much less room to play in her new garden, but they adjusted their games to fit. When Mr. Dovetail thought about his new house or the king, nobody knew. He never discussed these matters with the fellow servants, but he quietly went to work earning the money he needed to support his daughter and raising Daisy as best as he could without her mother. Daisy, who liked helping her father in his carpenter's workshop, had always been happiest in overalls. She wasn't the kind of person who didn't mind getting dirty, and she was very interested in clothes. Yet the days following the funeral, she wore a different dress every day to take a fresh posy to her mother's grave. While alive, Miss Dovetail had always tried to make her daughter look, as she put it, like a little lady, and had made her many beautiful gowns, sometimes from the offcuts of material that King Fred graciously let her keep after she'd made his superb costumes. And so a week passed, and then a month, and then a year, until the dresses her mother had sewn were all too small for Daisy, but she kept them carefully in her wardrobe. Other people seemed to have forgotten what happened to Daisy, or had got used to the idea of her mother being gone. Daisy pretended she was used to it, too. On the surface, her life turned to something like normal. She helped her father in the workshop, did her schoolwork, and played with her best friend, Bert. But they never spoke about her mother, and they never talked about the king. Every night, Daisy lay with her eyes fixed on the distant white headstone shining in the moonlight until she fell asleep. Chapter 6, The Fight in the Courtyard. There was a courtyard behind the palace where peacocks walked, fountains played, and statues of former kings and queens kept watch. As long as they didn't pull the peacocks' tails, jump in the fountain, or climb the statues, the children of the palace servants were allowed to play in the courtyard after school. Sometimes Lady Aslanda, who liked children, would come and make daisy chains with them. The most exciting thing of all was when King Fred came out the door up to the balcony and waved, which made all the children cheer, bow, and curtsy as their parents had taught them. The only time the children fell silent, seized their games of hopscotch, and stopped fighting to fight, stopped pretending to fight the Ichabod, was when Lords Spittleworth and Flapoon passed through the courtyard. These two lords weren't fond of children at all. They thought little brats made far too much noise in the late afternoon, precisely the time when Spittleworth and Flapoon liked to take a nap between hunting and dinner. One day, shortly after Bert and Daisy's seventh birthday, when everyone was playing the usual between the fountains and the peacocks, the daughter of the new head seamstress, who was wearing a beautiful dress rose pink brocade, said, Oh, I do hope the king waves at us today. Well, I don't, said Daisy, who couldn't help herself and didn't realize how loudly she'd spoken. The children all gasped and turned looking to her. Daisy felt hot and cold at once, seeing them all glaring. You shouldn't have said that, whispered Bert. As he was standing right next to Daisy, the older children were staring at him too. I don't care, said Daisy, color rising in her face. She started now, as so she might as well finish. If he hadn't worked my mother so hard, she should still be alive. Daisy felt as though she'd been wanting to say that out loud for a long time. There was another gasp from all the surrounding children, and a maid's daughter actually squealed in terror. He's the best king of cornucopia we've ever had, said Bert, who'd heard his mother say so many times. No, he isn't, Daisy said loudly. He's selfish, vain, and cruel. Daisy, whispered Bert, horrified. Don't be, don't be silly. It was the word silly that did it. Silly, when the new head seamstress's daughter smirked and whispered her hand to her friend, while pointing at Daisy's overall. Silly. When her father wiped away their tears in his evening, thinking Daisy wasn't looking, silly. When to talk to her mother when she had to visit a cold white headstone. 
Daisy drew back her head and smacked Bert right in the face. Then the oldest Roach brother, whose name was Rod Roderick and now lives in Daisy's old bedroom, shouted, Don't let her get away with it, Butterball, and let all the boys in shouts of fight, fight, fight. Terrified, Bert gave Daisy's shoulder a half-hearted shove, and it seemed that Daisy that the only thing to do was to launch herself at Bert, and everyone, everything became dust and elbows until suddenly the two children were pulled apart by Bert's father, Major Beamish, come running out of the palace on hearing the commotion to find out what was going on. Dreadful behavior, muttered Lord Spittleworth, walking past the Major and the two sobbing, struggling children. But as he turned away, a broad smirk spread over Lord Spittleworth's face. He was a man who knew how to turn a situation to good use. He thought that he might have found a way to banish children, or some of them anyway, from the palace courtyard. Chapter 7 Lord Spittleworth Tells Tales That night, the two lords dined, as usual, with King Fred. After a sumptuous meal of barren stone venison, accompanied by the finest Jerobian wine, Jeroboam wine, followed by a selection of Kurzberg cheeses and some of Miss Beamish's feather-light fairy's cradles. Lord Spittleworth decided the moment had come. He cleared his throat and said, I do hope, Your Majesty, that you weren't disturbed by the disgusting fight among the children in the courtyard this afternoon. Fight, repeated King Fred, who'd been talking to his tailor about the design for a new cloak, so he heard nothing. What fight? Oh, dear, I thought Your Majesty knew, said Lord Spittleworth, pretending to be startled. Perhaps Major Beamish could tell you about it. But King Fred was amused rather than disturbed. Oh, I believe scuffles among children are quite usual. Spittleworth, Spittleworth and Flapoon exchanged looks behind the king's back. Spittleworth tried again. Your Majesty, as ever, the very soul of kindness. Your Majesty is as ever the very soul of kindness, said Spittleworth. Of course, some kings, Flapoon muttered, brushing crowns off the front of his waistcoats. They had heard that a child spoke of the crowns so disrespectfully. What's that? exclaimed Fred, the smile fading from his face. Child spoke of me disrespectfully? Fred couldn't believe it. He was used to the children shrieking with excitement when he bowed from them to the balcony. I believe so, Your Majesty, said Spitterworth, examining his fingernails. But as I mentioned, it was Major Beamish who separated the children. He has all the details. The candles sputtered a little in their silver sticks. Children say all manner of things. In fun, said King Fred. Doubtless the child meant no harm. Sounded like bally treason to me, grunted Flapoon. But, said Spitterworth slipfully, it is Major Beamish who knows the details. Flapoon and I may perhaps have misheard. Fred swept, sipped his wine. At that moment, a footman entered the room to remove the pudding plates. Cankerby, said King Fred, for such was the footman's name, fetch Major Beamish here. Unlike the king and the two lords, Major Beamish didn't eat seven courses for dinner every night. He finished his supper hours ago and was getting ready for bed when the summons from the king arrived. The major hastily swapped his pajamas for his uniform and dashed back to the palace, by which time King Fred, Lord Spittleworth, and Lord Flapoon had retired to the yellow parlor, while they were sitting on satin armchairs, drinking more Jeroboam wine, and in Flapoon case, eating a second plate of fairy's cradles. Ah, beamish, said King Fred, as the major made a deep bow. I, he I he hear there was a little commotion in the courtyard this afternoon. The major's heart sank. He had hoped that the news of Bert and Daisy's fight wouldn't reach the king's ears. Oh, it was really nothing, your majesty, said Beamish. Come, come, Beamish, said Flapoon. You should be proud that you've taught your son not to tolerate traitors. I, there was no question of treachery, said Major Beamish. They're only children, my lord. Do I understand that your s son defended me, Beamish? Major Beamish was in the most unfortunate position. He didn't want to tell the king what Daisy had said. Whatever his own loyalty to the king, he quite understood why the motherless little girl had felt the way she did about Fred. And the last thing he wanted to do was get her in trouble. At the same time, he was well aware that there were 20 witnesses who could tell the king exactly what Daisy had said, and was sure that if he lied, Lord Spittleworth and Lord Flapoon would tell the king that he, Major Beamish, was also disloyal and treacherous. I, yes, your majesty, it's true that my son Bert defended you, said Major Beamish. However, allowance must be must surely be made for the little girl who said the unfortunate thing about your majesty. She's passed through a great deal of trouble, your majesty. And even unhappy grown-ups may talk wildly at times. What kind of trouble has the girl passed through? Asked King Fred, who couldn't imagine any good reason for a subject to speak rudely. She, her name is Daisy Dovetail, your majesty, said Major Beamish, staring over King Fred's head at a picture of his father, King Richard the Righteous.
Her mother was the seamstress who, yes, yes, I remember, said King Fred loudly, cutting Major Beamish off. Very well, that's all, Beamish. Off you go. Somewhat relieved, Major Beamish bowed deeply again and had almost reached the door when he heard the king's voice. What exactly did the girl say, Beamish? Major Beamish paused with his hand on the doorknob. There was nothing else for it but to tell the truth. She said that your majesty is selfish, vain, and cruel, said Major Beamish. Not daring to look at the king, he left the room.